Hello, welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Jet Smith and I'm the head coach for speech and debate at Highland High School in Pocatello, Idaho. This is a topic lecture on the new March 2024 public forum debate topic from the National Speech and Debate Association. And the topic reads, in the United States, collegiate student athletes should be classified as employees of their educational institution. In this video, we're gonna cover three main things. We're gonna discuss the resolution, then we will go over 10 pro arguments, and then we'll go over 10 con arguments. When we analyze a resolution, there's five things we want to look at, trichotomy or what type of topic it is, definitions of key terms, the background that led to this topic being chosen, the stakeholders or people that will be affected by the topic's outcome, and the core issues likely to be discussed. So first on what type of topic it is, this one is less clear than most of the public forum debate resolutions have been this year. There are three main types of debate topics. There are policy, fact, and value topics. And again, the topic reads, in the United States, collegiate student athletes should be classified as employees of their educational institution. Now, much like when instead of asking you to do the dishes directly, your mom says, it sure would be nice if the dishes were done, this topic is about an action, but does not make it a statement of action. So I would claim that this is mostly a policy topic because it kind of has an actor from the United States and it says the word should, but rather than giving a desirable action, it more means like a desirable outcome. Um, and the action would be being classified as employees. So it is a policy topic, but it doesn't list who is going to classify the employees as employees. Now, this is very similar to a debate topic from 2017. In December of 2017, there was a public forum topic that read, NCAA student athletes ought to be recognized as employees under the Fair Labor Standards Act. This topic would likely have the exact same outcome. So if you're wondering what it would mean to vote pro, this would likely be the outcome. Now, the second part of analyzing this resolution is going over definitions. The first term that it's important to understand is what are collegiate student athletes? And most of the definitions you can find are very circular. They'll sell things like it's a student who is an athlete in college. Uh, a more specific definition that you can get from the NCAA or National Collegiate Athletic Association reads, a student athlete is a student whose enrollment was solicited by a member of the athletic staff with a view towards the student's ultimate participation in the intercollegiate athletics program or when the student reports for an intercollegiate squad that is under the jurisdiction of the athletics department. A student is not deemed a student athlete solely on the basis of prior high school athletics participation. So it has to be somebody actively competing or intending to compete at the collegiate level. A shorter, clearer definition that you can get from a journal of psychology is a collegiate student athlete refers to a full-time or part-time student who is registered at a university who participates in organized and competitive athletic programs. The second term in the resolution that it's important to understand is classified as employees. So what is an employee? According to Cambridge Dictionary, an employee is generally considered anyone who performs services if the businesses can control what will be done and how it will be done. More specifically, to be classified as an employee happens at a few different levels. Uh, the IRS and the National Labor Review Board has different standards for what workers must be allowed to do or must be provided depending on what type of worker they are. So there are different rules depending on the classifications. However, it's up to each individual business to decide how to classify their workers. So one business might classify their workers as full-time employees, while another business might classify their employees as contract workers or gig workers or independent contractors. So according to paylocity.com, employees classifications are categorizations of employees based on their job duties, responsibilities, and compensation, and they are used by employers to maintain compliance with labor laws. Types include exempt and non-exempt, full-time employees, part-time employees, contract employees, independent contractors, temporary employees, on-call employees, and volunteers. These types do not have strict definitions in federal or state laws, meaning employers have some freedom when developing an employee certification policy. In the status quo, because these workers are not recognized by a very important law called the Fair Labor Standards Act, they're not really classified as anything, which means the voting for the pro would essentially take these collegiate student athletes from not being recognized at all by different labor review boards and organizations and laws, and instead classify them as employees. 
Now, why are we debating this topic? What's the background behind the resolution? College sports have gone from fun extracurricular activities done by a handful of students to a massively financially lucrative industry that feeds into professional leagues and has millions of fans that watch every single year. Specifically, there are now over half a million student athletes participating in National Collegiate Athletics Associations, or NCAA sports, as of 2022. The most popular sports are men's football, baseball, basketball, and track, and women's softball, basketball, soccer, and track. 37% of these 520,000 athletes, roughly, are at Division I schools, 25% are at Division II schools, and 38% are at Division III schools. The division of school that you're in determines who you're going to be competing against, the level of resources at your school, and how large of an institution you go to. So there are people at really, really high-level schools competing in collegiate sports, but there are also people competing at community colleges and smaller institutions. Now, if you are a college athlete as part of the NCAA, you can, but are not guaranteed to receive compensation for deals related to your NIL. NIL stands for name, image, and likeness. So before 2021, you could not make any money as a college athlete off of things like product endorsements, social media posts, video game deals, autographs. But now, as of 2021, it's up to each individual state's laws to determine whether or not an athlete can be paid. The NCAA used to make it illegal to receive any compensation for your name, image, and likeness as a student athlete, but now you can However, they make it impossible for you to be paid for play. So a college cannot pay you in money like a regular business can if you want to maintain your eligibility for the NCAA. This is so you can maintain something called amateur status. So the resolution essentially would be forcing the NCAA to change their rules to allow college student athletes to both be paid for their name, image, and likeness deals, but also to allow college institutions to classify their athletes as employees so that they could pay them for their play. Now, many people believe that employee status is actually inevitable and it's only a matter of time because there are several major Supreme Court and lower court cases that are moving through our judicial system. Some of these include House versus NCAA, the NLRB case against the USC Pac-12 and NCAA, Matt Bewley et al. versus NCAA, Jackson versus NCAA, and the Dartmouth unionization petition. I would strongly encourage looking into each of these cases to see how it's possible that they are resolved during the month that this topic is debated, but also to see how it may be inevitable and it's debating now rather than taking an action, debating whether the harms or benefits will outweigh when this action is inevitably taken. The fourth thing to discuss is the stakeholders, or who cares about the implementation of this resolution, who is it going to affect? The first and primary stakeholder is going to be colleges because those are the educational institutions as referred to in the resolution, as well as universities. How does this affect their finances, their recruiting, their retention, all sorts of things like that. You also have students, both student athletes and regular students that this will likely affect based on the decision. Professional sports leagues that gain players and recruit people from college sports, as well as fans of college and professional sports could also be affected by the outcome of this resolution. Finally, on framing, there are a couple of core issues that are likely to be discussed on both sides of this resolution. The first is the value of amateurism versus commercialism. Uh, the con is likely to say that part of the best thing about college sports is that anyone can participate and anyone can try things because it's focused on amateurs. The pro will argue that this has actually not been the case for some time and that instead college sports has been commercialized, so it's important to fairly pay employees for what they do. Another is the value of education versus monetization. The con is likely to say that the focus should be on the student aspect of student athletes, and the pro is likely to say that the amount of work being done as a student athlete is worthy of being paid. The last core issue to discuss is that this topic is sort of a one-size-fits-all approach when every single college sport, let alone every single college sport program at different schools, is different. Large schools and large sports programs versus small schools and small programs make different amounts of money or lose different amounts of money, have varying rates of participation and viewership. How the topic will affect each of those individual types of sports and programs is likely to be discussed. 
Now that we understand what the resolution is asking us about, let's get into 10 pro arguments or contentions as to why we should classify collegiate student athletes as employees. The first major argument that the pro could turn into a contention is about fair compensation. Each of these arguments will be phrased as the three parts of a contention with uniqueness, link, and impact. For the pro, that means what is going wrong in the current world, how does voting for the topic change it, and impact why does this matter for the better? What is the positive consequence? So for this first argument about fair compensation, college athletes are helping their institutions make millions, if not billions of dollars across the industry, but are not paid any of the money that they are contributing to these colleges making. If we classify athletes as employees, then just like any other worker benefiting their business and helping make them money, then they will be paid for that work. This would acknowledge the value that student athletes are bringing, reduce economic inequality between student athletes and other students, and end the essentially wage theft that is currently happening at the hands of colleges. The second argument that you could read as a contention for the pro is financial security. Many athletes are currently financially insecure because they are not getting paid for the intense amount of work that they must do as a student athlete, which can often ask for 40 plus hours a week, which makes them too busy to get a job elsewhere, or if they have to get a job elsewhere, then the rest of their life is being sacrificed. If we treat them as employees, this would require them to be paid wages, which would, in addition to scholarships, help cover the daily living expenses that students have just by trying to be alive. This means that students will be more financially secure, less financially stressed, and have more time and energy to focus on their sports and their studies, making them save more money and reducing student poverty. The third argument as to why we should classify collegiate student athletes as employees of their educational institution is ending worker exploitation. Athletes have tons of requirements and restrictions on their time, behavior, and abilities, but unlike other employees, have no say in the level of work that they must perform or how they should be compensated for that work. If we classify employees as, or athletes as employees, they can negotiate with their colleges, they can collectively bargain and potentially unionize, and they can finally get the representation that they need to express their wishes. This means that student athletes will learn valuable life skills that transfer to the rest of their working careers after college sports are over, teaching them how to self-advocate, ending their exploitation, and making sure that they have a say in their day-to-day -day life as workers. The fourth argument that the pro could read is ensuring balance. Athletes are expected to put in 40 plus hours of work a week to their sports without pay, which forces them to split the little time they have left between getting another job, working on school, maintaining relationships, and engaging in self-care. If athletes are reclassified as employees, then they could negotiate for better working conditions, make sure that they're not getting overworked or going over time without getting paid over time, and improve the likelihood that they have the time needed for rest, study, and relationship building. This will improve their work-life balance, teaching them the importance of work-life balance for the rest of their lives, improve their mental health, and reduce overall stress. The fifth argument that the pro can read is about improving health of athletes. Now, in the status quo, athletes are highly at risk of injuries and long-term physical health problems as a result of playing sports. But unlike other types of workers in dangerous jobs, they don't get guaranteed health insurance, and if they get injured as a result of their job, they cannot apply for disabilities. If employee status is granted to student athletes, then they can get health insurance as part of their employment and have the opportunity to apply for disability insurance if injuries are gained as a result of their labor as a student athlete. This means that in the long term, their physical and financial health will improve, they will have better safety precautions, programs will be more likely to care about the safety of their workers to avoid having to lose them and having to pay more money in insurance and disability, and reduce overall medical debt for future student athletes. The sixth argument that the pro could read for why we should classify collegiate student athletes as employees of their educational institutions is to ensure racial equality. College sports are a highly racially diverse field with many players come from racial minority groups that face economically difficult conditions before becoming an athlete, while being an athlete, and after their college athletic careers are over. 
If we classify athletes as employees of their institutions, this will help build the resumes, build savings, and reduce the overall debt of racial minority players to help them combat the economic struggles they face. This reduces racial inequality and breaks generational cycles of poverty that often affect minority players, helping them overcome structural barriers to their success after college is over. The seventh argument the pro could read is about growing overall sports participation. In the status quo, very few athletes actually attempt to keep playing sports after high school is over because they feel that it's not a financially viable opportunity. This means that many sports don't get as much participation, as much viewership, or as much community involvement as they otherwise would. If we classify collegiate athletes as employees, then there will be more of a financial incentive to keep playing sports in college, even if you're not planning on going pro. This builds a fan base, a volunteer base for coaches for younger people, and makes it so that the benefits of playing sports apply to more people throughout our country and even the world. This means that there will be more growth at the professional and even junior levels, increasing revenues for the sports industry. The eighth argument as to why we should classify collegiate athletes as employees of their educational institutions is to reduce turnover, reduce turnover. Many athletes leave college sports or don't even try uh, because of financial pressures, dissatisfaction with their working conditions, or getting better opportunities at other schools. But if we make them employees, that comes with additional benefits and protections, making them less likely to quit college sports and stay at the same college to build relationships, earn raises, and it makes them more likely to sign employee contracts like other jobs do to be there for multiple seasons, allowing teams to be more consistent, and then they have to spend less amount of money on training and recruiting, there will be more stable player rosters, and they'll end up working to get better, better as teammates to improve their team's performance. The ninth argument that the pro can read is decreasing antitrust litigation. Now, the NCAA has faced a lot of lawsuits over its treatment of athletes and the structure of college athletic programs, essentially because it's treated as a monopoly in a lot of ways. If we classify athletes as employees, then they can clarify the rights and responsibilities of the athletes and the NCAA, reducing the overall amount of lawsuits against the NCAA thanks to negotiations and college institutions. This will save college sports programs and the NCAA money that they can instead spend on paying players, funding scholarships, upgrading facilities, and retaining high-quality coaches rather than having to spend all of their money on expensive court cases. The tenth and final argument that the pro could read is about improving working conditions. Athletes often face demanding conditions to the detriment of their well-being with incredibly long hours for practice, games, and travel, and a lot of academic commitments. Employees would be entitled to several protections, such as limits on working hours, safe working conditions, and other laws that protect them from the National Labor Review Board. This would improve the overall well-being, athletic performance, and even college experience of athletes. So now that we've given 10 reasons why we may want to classify collegiate student athletes as employees of their educational institutions, what are some reasons why we would not want to do that? What are the potential downsides? Here are 10 con level arguments that could be turned into contentions. The first con argument is damaged job security. Right now, student athletes have a high level of security in their position as long as they don't violate the rules of their institution or the NCAA. Even if they have poor performance, unless they're breaking the law of their country, state, or institution, they're not going to lose their scholarship or their position on the team. But if you classify student athletes as employees, then they're going to be subject to the same conditions as other workers where they can be fired or replaced at any time simply for not performing as well as they thought they would be. This is detrimental because if you get fired as a student athlete halfway through the semester, this could cause financial instability, high levels of stress, and even force you to drop out because you can no longer afford to attend your college. The second argument as to why we should not classify collegiate athletes as employees of their educational institution is that it will decrease the amateurism present within college sports. 
The current scholarship and club system of teams means that amateur players maintain the focus of collegiate sports. Rather than trying to find professional players that can make this a lifelong career, the idea is to get as many people as possible to try and play sports because of the benefits that playing sports has. But if you classify student athletes as employees, the focus goes from having a good time, having fun, and teaching people benefits through sports to professionalization and commercialization to try and make the most amount of money you possibly can. Shifting away from amateurism will make the playing field for trying sports in college less equal, decrease the overall amount of fairness in college admissions for sports scholarships, and make it so that getting recruited as an athlete becomes more of a focus than even school is. The third argument for the con is that it will likely decrease athletic scholarships. Many student athletes currently receive scholarships that cover the cost of their education, so that they can play sports for their university. However, if these people are classified as employees, that is going to cost an insane amount of money, likely resulting in scholarships being entirely reduced or eliminated. But if you eliminate scholarships and replace them with just paying people money, that makes college less affordable, likely will cause dropouts, and decreases long-term financial security because they can spend this money on things other than their tuition, and the lack of financial responsibility in most college students means that they will no longer be able to afford the cost of college. The fourth con argument to avoid adopting the resolution is that it will decrease the focus on school. Student athletes are currently students first and athletes second, but if we classify them as employees, then they will stop focusing as much on their school and focus more in athletics to make sure that they can make the most amount of money possible, maintain raises, and keep their job. This will likely negatively affect their academic performance. This also will hurt their future career prospects if they don't learn as much from college or if eventually they drop out after they've gotten their full-time eligibility for being in the season. The fifth reason to avoid adopting the resolution is that it will financially strain schools. Colleges and universities are already struggling to fund college athletic programs and any other operations thanks to declining funding from the state and federal government and decreased enrollment rates from fewer kids going to college. If you classify student athletes as employees, this is going to massively increase the cost of maintaining athletic programs, especially for Division II and III schools that don't have these massive programs that make millions of dollars. This will likely result in either the programs being eliminated reduce spending on facilities and coaching for sports, or having to charge all students more money to go to college, making college even less affordable. The sixth argument is about hurting smaller sports. Currently, most colleges and universities support a wide range of sports, not just the big ones like football, basketball, and baseball. And they even support sports that really don't draw in a huge amount of viewers or sponsors, but are more like Olympic style sports. When you increase the amount of cost of student athletics by making all student athletes employees, not just those in really financially productive programs, then colleges are going to have to cut spending. And the biggest likelihood is that they will cut spending on smaller athletic programs where they couldn't afford to pay every single lacrosse player, every single kid that does bowling, or every golf player. This will limit overall opportunities for student athletes to get scholarships in these sports, to discover their passions and benefit from playing them, decrease choices for students, and this will damage the professional level of these less common sports as fewer people will be filtered into them thanks to the experiences they have in college. The seventh argument the con could make as to why we should not classify student athletes at colleges as employees is that it will hurt international student athletes. There are over 24,000 international student athletes currently enrolled and competing at schools in sports under the NCAA. If we classify student athletes as employees, this would violate the no working clause of most of the athletes' visas. This could result in mass deportations, make it so that fewer people from other countries want to travel to the United States for school and to play sports, and reduce the quality of players and therefore the game itself in college athletics. The eighth argument you could make as the con is that it will result in players being taxed. 
Currently, student athletes are not taxed for their scholarships or stipends that they may receive as a result of playing college sports. But if they're classified as employees, just like any other worker, their income from athletics becomes taxable. This could lead to financial hardship for student athletes, especially those from low income backgrounds, lead to potential violations of federal laws, and overall reduce the financial security of student athletes across the board. The ninth argument as to why we should not classify collegiate student athletes as employees of their educational institutions is there are better alternatives to how to solve the problems, and that's the ninth and tenth arguments. The first alternative I'll provide is increased funding for athletic scholarships. Currently, funding for sports scholarships is insufficient at many schools, and instead of spending the money to pay student athletes as employees, colleges and universities should take the money they would have spent and instead fund more athletic scholarships. This means that more kids will get to go to college in the first place because they can afford it, decrease the overall amount of student loan debt, and it would avoid the harms of whatever contentions we talked about earlier if you pair it with this contention. The tenth and final argument I have for the con is another alternative, and this would be profit or revenue sharing. Now, some college programs, but not most, do bring in millions or even billions of dollars thanks to the hard work of student athletes, but most programs actually lose money. This alternative would say, if your student athletic program is making money as a result of the student athletes, then some of the profits should have to be shared with those students. However, this would only work if there was money being made, so this avoids the problems of paying athletes on the Quidditch team who aren't going to generate revenue for your school. This incentivizes better student performance, and it avoids the harms of whatever contention you decide to read along with it. In terms of final thoughts for this topic, I think it's important to read a lot of articles and watch a lot of videos from the perspective of people that are in the college sports industry, coaches, players, administrators, referees, because most debaters do not come from a sports world, this topic might be hard to understand if you don't hear it from the perspective of people who are in this world all the time. It's also important to think forward. What happens after these athletes are made employees and make that the focus of your research and preparation? Lastly, make sure to focus on the impacts. Many of your judges are unlikely to be huge college sports fans, and if they are college sports fans, it's likely only for the biggest sports. It's important to focus on the impacts, but not just the impacts that affect the student athletes themselves, but how those will spill over to affect regular everyday people, including the judge. I hope that this topic lecture is helpful for you, and I wish you the best of luck debating this topic, particularly to the Idaho students that are competing in public forum at the State Debate Championship on this topic in a week. I wish you the best of luck, and I will see you in the next video.